the Southwest region, which is our region is the states of Arizona and New Mexico, and I'm a uh, restoration partnership coordinator. Uh, I'm also a tribal member, uh, tribal president, tribal reservation president. Um, other experience uh, with tribes, uh, I work for BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, started as a firefighter, GS4, with them and built uh, a career and established a, a career in BIA forestry. Um, and then eventually transitioned into a agency superintendent, which is a line officer uh, for the BIA at the Southern Ute um, Agency in Southwest Colorado. My forestry career has been all in the Southwest. In fact, my entire career uh, has been in the Southwest, Four Corners, Arizona, New Mexico. I am from the Asada Pueblo, Asada Laguna Pueblo in central New Mexico. We're a farming tribe, community agriculturist. Um, our home is along the Rio Grande River below Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, 20 mi 25 miles, beautiful place. I lived there, grew up there, family there, and will be there. Uh, my background, uh, has given me experience and opportunities to uh, work with tribes my entire career. And as a civil servant with the federal government, it's been my contribution and commitment to improve life for tribes and tribal members, focusing in on natural resource, uh, forestry, protection of their uh, important places. And now with the Forest Service, it brings on a new opportunity to engage with tribes, to be able to allow tribes a part of the Forest Service role, role and responsibility. We're doing that through shared stewardship. We're doing that through initiatives that, that existed even before shared stewardship. Places across the country and tribes across the country have worked with partnerships of various sorts, various manners. And we've got fine examples of, of good projects, good relationships. Um, however, those, those relationships must roll the tide of politics and funding and priorities, transitions of tribal governments, transitions of local political entity governments, changes in the federal government must be considered and um, are part of the challenges for tribes um, to, to build solid programs in some cases. But yet there are good examples. And, and uh, in the Southwest with the Forest Service, we're using our authorities to the fullest extent possible, knowing that we do have obstacles internally with funding, um, with priorities, with our own delivery of Forest Service programs to all of the public, not just tribes. And, that, and that's been my passion is to try and elevate that connection to tribes within our Forest Service programs. A lot of opportunities. We do a lot, those of us who work in the Forest Service, Aaron's here, I'm not sure if there's other Forest Service employees in here, but we, we try and always keep in mind our local communities and we're doing a better job of it in the last few years of recognizing this is who we are. We're not Forest Service separate from your communities. We're not Forest Service who's separate from the tribes. I'm a tribal member. I'm part of the Forest Service. That's a good connection, I think. And, and, and I hope to be able to utilize our authorities We've got some new ones that are in the hat right now that, that are exciting and make me all happy to see because I've, I've promoted, I've advocated for the strengthening of tribal ability to manage their own resources, use this to develop economic development, improve conditions, provide jobs, employment, training, a future for our generations to come. So the intent of these authorities my delivery of them, as best of my ability in the Forest Service, based on all of our internal challenges, is to provide that as a future 
to be able to take on managing the portions of Forest Service land that were taken away from tribes. No one can argue that point that the Forest Service was created on tribal land. We didn't own them, we didn't possess them, we used them, we, we visited them, we, we, we still do that. My future is to allow our authorities, thank you tribes for advocating for them, for fighting for them, going to Washington. I can't, as a federal employee, lobby government. But I am, I'm a tribal member. I vote in tribal elections on who my council, who my leaders are gonna be. And I would hope that they talk to me and, and say, hey, what's going on and where could we work with the Forest Service a little bit better and, and tell me a little bit about what you do. Um, I also see a big role of all of you as partners because as much as we want to respect the tribal government to government relationship with the federal government, our hands are tied in terms of funding ability and outreach and connection. Um, as I mentioned, tribal relations is a small portion of what we do in the national forest system. But there are sources and partners out there who want to develop better relationships with tribes. Connect with them, please. Um, respecting the, the decision making to develop a relationship is solely up to the tribe. I can only administer Forest Service programs to tribes who want to do that. And, uh, it maximizes our efficiency to be able to really work with tribes that they, 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 they must have at least a vision, a plan, a structure, a thought, objectives, goals. I like the idea of connecting and, and uh, considering programs and projects that are brought that include youth, that include solving some social problems, education, um, elderly programs, elderly input, elderly connections, the, the ability to think about all of our tribal needs, health. There's health programs out there. There's, there's cultural programs, arts, crafts, things that continue traditional um, <coughs> preservation. The Forest Service, let me give you a cool example, is, is that we're working with tribes in the Southwest, my tribes, the Pueblo tribes, working with BIA and, and interconnecting uh, reserve treaty rights lands program, RTRL, which is an interior side, in which I advocate for these interconnecting federal programs, state programs, in various ways to, to put together a, a nice package. We're restoring uh, forest lands um, with specific focus on Douglas fir, which is a traditional important aspect of our culture. We dance with it, we pray with it, we, we pray when we go get it, we, we bring it down miles regardless of weather on foot as it's been done for centuries. We need it's not just a tree. It's not just a, a species. It's not just um, a tree. It's it's home to to us. It's home to our wildlife. It's home to our spirits that we pray to. That's where they live in the forest. That's where they are. That's that's part of them. Part of us. And, and we'll do that dance for centuries. I hope. But we need that. We need that place. And a lot of those places are right across the border on Forest Service land. So hopefully we're considering that when we develop forest management plans, we revise them, we, we adopt them, we implement them, we roll them out. Tribes should be part of that. That's, that's the cool part of my job. Uh, I probably have used enough time. I, let's let's get into some questions about authorities, please. And you you ask me, ask the panel what you want to hear. 
from my little overview of what I think and what my vision is. Thank you. Great. Yeah, unless there's any burning or clarifying questions, we'll move on to get to the round table. Okay, thank you for listening. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for your interest in this. And uh, John uh, set the stage here for the outreach and engagement efforts that we uh, employ when we uh, gain that tribal support for any of the initiatives that we're doing. And I just want to start with introducing myself. My name is Belinda Brown. I'm a co selecta band member of the Ojibwe Oxybay Nation otherwise known as the Pitt River Tribe. We're in Northeastern California. We cover four counties and uh, have about 3,700 people in our tribe. And it's, it's overwhelming, uh, some of the issues that John brought up about uh, the public land and the Forest Service and the jurisdictional boundaries and all these lines that were drawn all through us. And, uh, through our ancestral land bases makes it really hard and difficult to work with agencies and organizations and elected officials and our own elected officials. And so um, I think one of the important things, and RBCC is very good at doing it, is just opening up the dialogue and being able to communicate and reach out and engage with folks that we don't generally communicate and reach out and engage with. And some of that has to do with understanding how tribal governments work, sovereign governments work, and how to work in that intergovernmental affairs coordination arena. And so we know, scientists know what we need to do on the land to conserve the land, the best practices, the protocols for that. Um, and we also have those best protocols and best practices for outreach and engagement with tribal communities. There's the tribal governments, there's uh, the elected officials, there's the tribal communities, and then there's the, um, the traditional leaders. And so to find those traditional leaders, sometimes those community change makers, we need to go beyond our eight to five. And that's the other thing is, is we're available that eight to five and, and the people that we want are out there. Sometimes we have to drive far distances to do the face to face to build the trust of uh, what authority we're gonna use for Loma Patsy Restoration Project. I'm the tribal partnerships manager. We use the master stewardship authority. We're not that impressed with the good neighbor authority because it left the tribes out of getting the receipts back into our community. And so it's like favoring the state. So again, the, um, the authorities aren't equitable. And so how do we even the playing field, so to speak, so that tribes are really included here? Um, from the beginning of RBCC, I mean, is it how many brown people are in the room? How many tribal sovereign governments are here? Why would this group want to leverage those tribal authorities? And in a, in a not disrespectful way, I've always said, we're like the tool in the shed that nobody knows how to use. I mean, it's like a power tool, but they open the shed and they close it because it's scary. You know, how do we do that? And how do we get those sovereign nations on board with us? And I think that connection, one of our elders just uh, passed away in the Rogue Valley. And to say in the longest distance is um, that 14 inches between our head and our heart. You know, that's the longest distance that we have to travel. And so I, I just ask and encourage all of you today to, when you, when you think about the tribes and when you think about indigenous people and lands, and you think about your own care and your own tending for your, care, your backyard, that's what it was to us. And I tell folks this share all the time that um, it was our Home Depot, it was our grocery store, it was our church, um, it was our pharmacy. So very well tended landscape. So how do we bring that down to the jurisdictional boundaries? So say we have to work with Homeland Security, we have to work with the Department of Education, with the Department of Labor, with the USDA, with the Department of the Interior. All of our minerals are underground. We think it's the Forest Service, you know, taking obsidian. It's like, no, that's the Department of the Interior, you know? So all of these things and policy issues that the tribes have to understand and know. And so for, um, so for us, a lot of the times that the elders scold us, you know, we, we don't have enough information. We haven't given them the, enough information. The policy books that you see here, RBCC, 
are we getting this information to the tribe so that they can make educated decisions about what it is that we need? We're putting in a sequer down in, in the Rogue River Siskiyou. Tribal engagement, you know, the letters that go out to the tribes, you know, are, are we drafting resolutions? And I, that's one of the things I shared with Trent, you know, a lot of times you know, we draft the resolutions, we draft the position papers, and then we go, we get on the agenda of the tribal council and we share with them that information. Whether it's good, bad, ugly, we share that information so that they do have the option of making the best choices for their uh, their land bases. And for us, it's our heartland. Like John said, all of it is, is Indian country. You're on Indian country. So wherever you are, I mean, to be able to recognize that and then to say, okay, how do we best treat this vegetation type? How do we best practice um, our protocols for collaboration? How, because there's best practices in collaboration too. How to be inclusive here? How do we get those sovereign nations to the table? And, and sharing the information, sharing the success stories. In Northern California, we had the our tribe, Pit River tribe. Um, we used the mechanisms, the IFLA account, the Indian Forest Lands uh, assistance. assistance account, and uh, worked with the NRCS with three tribes and brought a workforce together on the ground that would have never been brought together on the ground without the collaboration, without the communication, and being able to uh, utilize the service first authority to do that. So um, these are all mechanisms that take plans, planning efforts. Uh, um, California Indian, I, we had to send $10 million back because we didn't have emergency operation plans for uh, Homeland Security. So uh, all this money's coming down and we, we're not even ready with a plan. And so then we get left out again. And so how we get the information I think is crucial to these tribal governments, how we share the information, how we uh, target different levels of audiences within tribal communities where we're um, providing the elected officials with what they need, we're helping small businesses in tribal uh, communities get incubated so that they can be a, a farm forest labor contractor, they can be federal government contractors in the SAM system. And I think the, all, of these, all of these components are crucial and everybody out here in, in this audience even has a piece of that. And um, I'm, I'm a sports mom so I'm always like, who do we put on the playing field here? You know, who's the person who's doing the grant writing? Who's the best person to go uh, present? So when you're looking around, even in the tribes, it's like, okay, what tribe is, is going to really have that, that heart for, for this project? Like the Huckleberry Mountain, I mean, they go, uh, the Klamath tribes go and collect huckleberries. So we want their input at how we protect and preserve that mountain, that resource and for subsistence. And uh, for uh, us, for indigenous people, aboriginal people, I think the subsistence, the tide of the land, just like all of you, is very, very important to us. For, for my family, we, we lived a lot on subsistence. I mean, hunting, fishing, uh, all of uh, plant gathering. So, so that type of lifestyle, even though some people look at it as poor, it really is a rich and fulfilling lifestyle. And those are the things we want to protect. We want to protect water. We want to protect and preserve our wildlife. We want to be a voice. Uh, again, the elder that just passed in the Rogue Valley, uh, you know, be a voice for the voiceless. Who is speaking for the fish and the wildlife right now? You know, that's what we need to think about. Who's speaking for those generations coming? Like, you know, uh, John just shared, we, we need to be thinking about that. And then marrying Western science and the research that we have with our indigenous aboriginal knowledge. And I, I think that's an easier bridge to cross now than it has been in the past because Western science is actually catching up with indigenous knowledge and we're real, realizing that we made some mistakes. And so when we look at the impact on our, our land and our country and the management practices that have been um, developed over over the, the time that we've had Western science, we look at not very good outcomes. And so how do we turn that clock back? How do we put good fire back on the ground? You know, fire became the enemy. Now, now we need to make fire our friend. Fire's medicine for the land, as uh, Frank Lake would say, and he's uh, down from the 
your Rockland Creek area and has done a lot of research for the Forest Service. And so how do we introduce those values back to a population that has been left out of planning, left out of drawing those jurisdictional boundaries, left out of having any kind of a voice of what happens to our backyard? And so that's the challenge of being able to include um, what we call ourselves America's family secret. We don't want to look at the history that happened uh, to America. And a lot of times we don't want to admit that we're still here. Uh, so many times um, we're in, uh, in places where, well, well, the Indians did that a long time. It's like, we're still here, we're still doing it, we're still burning. I grew up in a, in a huge cow ranch. We did everything wrong, but we did burn. We burned every spring, every fall. You know, there's a, a lot of things we didn't know back then, and there's uh, um, yeah, there's stories that you would not like to hear about how we made dams and you know how we got rid of critters and, and all of those things. But now we have best practices. We should be we should do better. Now that we know better, we should do better, and that's where uh, we are with tribes. I think today too. Now that we know better and that we can recognize that these sovereign nations and these indigenous aboriginal people had uh, a way to live on this land that was more harmonious, that was better for the land, that was better for them. Um, and I think that we look at all the socioeconomic uh, problems, you know, and the mental health disparities that we have today, and the people that have, our kids that have nature deficit disorder. I mean, can you even imagine? I mean, none of my kids could imagine nature deficit disorder. You know, they were woke up at three o'clock to go duck hunting or something, you know, whether they liked it or not. So those are the kind of things that we need to connect our youth back to. You know, this technology that we have now, that's not natural, that's not normal. And so how do we make those connections, those human connections? And the outreach and engagement with the tribal communities, I believe, is about making those human connections again to the first best stewards of the land who had the traditional values and the practices that we need to reincorporate it back into every project that we do. That every culture is unique. So we go from a Loma Posse restoration project over two states, um, working with tribes, uh, 20 tribes I outreached to this last year on different projects. So project by project basis, sage step, oak woodlands, mixed conifer, streamside recovery where we're uh, rehabilitating and recovering uh, red band trout was a subsistence species for us. Um, working with the Klamath tribes in master stewardship agreements for 10 years, restoring wildlife habitat for a mule deer, and then to, uh, for the woodpecker out there, which was a ceremonial uh, species. And so bringing that all back around to your own culture, your own aboriginal roots. And I, I always like to do this, it's like somewhere on this earth, you have a heartland. Um, Somewhere on this earth, you go back to a singing and a drumming and a dancing society. So just um, take a minute and, and think about that, that, that you now are, are that first best steward on the land. When they removed, forcibly removed, a lot of our people or uh, the act of genocide that was you know, on a lot of our people, they were removing a keystone species. So we are, you are, we are that keystone species that's supposed to keep this land in, in balance. We're, we're those caretakers. And I, I believe that we all have that uh, accountability now, that responsibility to care for our land in, the, in that way. So the, the people and the animals, um, the ceremonies that kept us, the ceremonies that came around the salmon, the ceremonies that came around, you know, putting the bear to sleep for the winter, all those rituals, all those ceremonies had meaning. And when people really connect to that, and people really connect to that indigenous part of their heart, because you're place-based now somewhere, you have a community, you're place-based, I don't think it's that far of a distance anymore. If we can think like that, collective consciously think like that, then the distance becomes shorter from our head to our heart. And all these mechanisms that we have, that we use, the toolboxes that we have, the information that we have, that we're sharing with each other, comes down to some common values. But we all need this earth, we all need this water. I mean, basically at the end of the day, we're water, dust, and a puff of air. So how do we gain that common ground to work together, 
to address the issues that we're addressing in, in the, the land, the water, the air that we have to breathe here. And, and we're, we are in this together. And so I think for the 93638 that we have now, that mechanism coming over from the Department of Interior to the USDA is huge. We didn't know that those departments didn't talk and they didn't know all of these mechanisms that, that we had to use. And so the Public Law uh, 11593, the, the Indian Employment uh, Act, I mean, that, that just was signed in 2017. A lot of these funding mechanisms and public laws get uh, drafted and then we don't know on the ground until five years and then we're scrambling and then the, the act or the law sunset or the executive order sunset something, the MOU sunset, and so we're scrambling to reinvent something else. And so I just you know encourage everybody just to pass on the knowledge, uh, pass on uh, the information to the tribal people that you know, have coffee, sit down, uh, and, and just open up that dialogue even if it is awkward and keep talking. And, and keep uh, in the process of developing these relationships, using the mechanisms, the tools that we have in the toolbox, and empowering and equipping and training um, those folks around you. This is all a live classroom. You, you're, uh, this peer learning network is just a really important aspect too of all learning together and being able to share that knowledge. And um, thank you. Great, thank you, Melinda. Um, <coughs> any burning or clarifying questions? We'll move on. Yeah. Belinda, because I'm not familiar with all the different kinds of authorities yet, can you say one more time, is it service for stewardship authority that was used preferentially in the Lomakasi over the Good Neighbor Authority? Um, actually, it's a master stewardship master. agreement authority that Lomakasi is right now a part of seven master stewardship agreements uh, throughout the region. Um, in California and Oregon, and it's a 10-year um, authority. It is, we're invited by tribes usually to help them put a master stewardship agreement together, and then you develop supplemental project agreements under that, which is more of the financial plan and how you're actually going to uh, work together, and uh, the Forest Service has their requirements that they put in for roads and equipment and how they're going to address all that in a financial plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned a forest account mm -hmm. that had a service first. Right. With service first, there's agreement between uh, the agencies to work with the tribes where the tribes just get a direct deposit into their account. So like say the NRCS, Department of Interior, the Forest Service, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they can just have an agreement, participating agreement, any kind of agreement that they put together to get the work done, master stewardship agreement, and then they can just dump the money into the IFLA account, and we all uh, do the project. So we're in partnership, we do the project, the money goes into the IFLA account, and the agencies have the authority to move that money without contracting. Okay, and so IFLA. You're not just a contractor, you're not just. IFLA is? The Indian Forest Land Assistance Account. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's through uh, BIA. Somebody's going to be BIA. Do you want to talk about it? It was established to provide a direct source of funding to tribes that had a, an agreement, a, a work plan. When, B, when BIA created it, it was a place to be able to obligate funds that were left over in other programs. That, you know, that didn't want the agency didn't want to revert back to Treasury at the end of the year if there was excess funds in a particular BIA program. The EFLA account became a repository that supported natural resource programs and uh, projects. It also was uh, used for timber sale proceeds as well too, for some collection, special collections like a timber sale or something um, that had a need for road repair uh, deposit funds to the IFLA account to do those certain projects. Great, thank you. Okay, Don. Todd Spavey, Tatsiaoyo. Uh, good morning. Thank you. That's uh, Ness Purse. Uh, Don Botanic, I'm uh, 
Umatilla tribal member through my father and Coeur d'Alene through my mother. I guess uh, some of my background, my, my mother grew up, or my mother was born 1915 in a logging camp. Um, her grandfather, Basil Lafleur, was the first tribal, one of the first Colorado tribal loggers back in 1915. Uh, grew up in Spokane Reservation, a Coeur d'Alene tribal member, and she was sent to Indian boarding school at the age of 12 in 1927. And that's where she met my father, the Chamawa Indian boarding school, which isn't too far from here. So that's where my, my father's Umatilla, and they met at uh, Chamawa Indian boarding school back in the early 30s. Moved up to Seattle where my dad, a part of World War II, and it's kind of an interesting story how my father was part of a special uh, defense Part of World War II defense contractor, but anyway, that's how we wound up in Boeing, where in Seattle, where I was born. And, but we did go back to uh, Umatilla and Spokane to hunt and fish, pick berries up in the Mount Adams area. And I got my degree in forest engineering from the University of Washington. I worked at the Seattle Water Department on a fire crew back in 1974, 46 years ago. It was kind of like where I started my, my career. Still, go, I'm never going to quit. Just like my dad, my dad, my parents lived till their 90s just because they never, they never quit. And that's my role models. But um, after, after, sorry, it's the very bottom there. You just got pulled it. But. Uh, after leaving uh, 78, I started working. Um, I was forest engineer at the Yakima Agency where there's you know, eight to 10 billion board feet, about half of the, half of the Northwest timber is in Yakima. Uh, went to be forest manager back, back at the, switch battery must be, yeah, I'll switch for Forest manager at Umatilla, then I went up to be forest manager at Spokane Agency, where my mother grew up. So our kids were born in, uh, at Umatilla, the other one daughter at Umatilla, one, one daughter at two daughters up in Spokane before I went to be regional forester in, in Billings for Rocky Mountain and the Great Plains. But one of the things, and as part of this Tribal Forest Protection Act uh, topic that I'm going to be talking about about is my daughters, when we would go to Longhouse and Coeur d'Alene, Plummer, or in Umatilla, my, my daughters would we'd come back and on the drive back, they'd say, oh, grandma's tribe, sure different from grandpa's tribe, just because they noticed how the ceremonies and we talked about the language and, and the difference and even how uh, our world is, is upside down, in fact, the word Suyapi for Europeans in, in the, uh, the Salish language ties into, uh, it's not tied to the word white or red or objectifying a human being, but it's, it describes a person's values of being upside down from the tribal values. And even the word protection is different in our forestry world. When, when you talk to most foresters, the word protection means like fire and bugs, that, that type of thing, versus tribal member, and that's even part of the act when you look at the Tribal Forest Protection Act. What's the criteria of protection? Uh, a forester may be just focusing on fire and, and insects, where the tribes work for protection would be looking at sacred sites, water, other, other parts of the environment. You have to almost understand why our world is, is viewed as actually Europeans being viewed as upside down, even in our tribal languages, that the English language is 70% noun and 30% verb. And when I looked at my father worked on our Umatilla tribal dictionary, when I looked at his words, the, the literal translation that I started noticing too is that uh, the tribal languages are 70% verb and 30% noun. 
So even our, that's why language is so important because it describes the activity. Even our, our religion, our Wasatch religion is active. The Wasatch word, uh, the literal translation is to dance and it's tied to the, uh, nature. When we say amen at our tribal dinners, we lift up water, taste our water, and chush is what we say, that's our amen. Um, one of the things I forgot to do uh, traditionally is also honor, honor the land that we're, we're sitting at, or uh, the Kalapuya tribe, um, I don't uh, acknowledge the Kalapuya tribe. If you ever get a chance to listen to Esther Stutzman, uh, she's on YouTube. There's a lot of great stories that she has about this Western Oregon area. Uh, Greg Archuleta, uh, traditional leader up at, uh, he's up at Tyron Park in Portland, does a lot of work up there, and Mike Wilson's the force manager for Grand Ron. But uh, getting back to understanding, um, that was one of the things that the Tribal Forest Protection Act that we had workshops, uh, three workshops to develop the Tribal Forest Protection Act, which was initiated after the 2003 San Diego fires where fires left Forest Service land and started to go on to burn over tribal land in, in Southern California. And in 2004, uh, working with uh, Nolan Colgrove and, and Merv George from the Hoopa tribe, they were part of the California Indian Fire a forest and fire management council and they worked with legislators to pass a law the tribal forest protection act back in 2004 and probably the first 10 years of that act of getting stewardship contracting for tribes to work on on federal lands blm or forest service lands there weren't very many maybe there was about six five or six uh, stewardship contracts in the first 10 years they did a review of the act and they said working with the Intertribal Timber Council, which is, we're a nonprofit organization of 60 member tribes nationwide. We have a pretty small staff. There's a staff of three. And so we really rely on our, our tribal members uh, as far as developing, working on projects. But the, the tribes worked on getting a report done and come to the Forest Service to say, well, why aren't there very many contracts going on? And that's when uh, Jim Hubbard with the Forest Service back then. So well, why don't we get together and start working on some workshops to develop some of these, uh, develop more of these stewardship contracts. And it was just a lot of things where people were just uncomfortable or not knowing how to work with tribes or just how do we work. People wanted to do it, but it was just how do we get these people together. So we developed three workshops in in the Northwest, California, and the Southwest, we actually get in Forest Service and tribe people at the table actually working on working on um, stewardship contracts, get the maps on the table, what, what are uh, things that we can agree on, and actually starting to figure out each institution's uh, processes. That, that's what, what we really needed to do and look at the act. What, how do you define protection? that each the Forest Service and the tribe had to start discussing at these workshops what is protection. Also part of the act is adjacency. What is adjacency? Is it right on the border or is it off the border? Um, and those are some of the things that these workshops looked at. And to give you some um, examples, um, one of the um, examples in the Northwest was I believe it was Mill Creek, Mill Creek with the Hoopa tribe. It was interesting that Nolan Colgrove was a forest manager at Hoopa, but then they, uh, they set up the, uh, initiated the contract about 2005. It's almost one of the first contracts, stewardship contracts they were looking at, this Mill Creek just off the Hoopa reservation. And he ended up being hired by the Forest Service, Six Rivers, so he went from being the forest manager over to the district ranger over at Six Rivers to actually look at implementing this, but one of the things when they looked at this project, there was like four phases to the project, and the first priority was the uh, uh, was more the environmentally challenging one. So that was one of the things that they were learning along the way is that uh, no 
don't get hung up on, on everybody looking at focusing on the first priority is looking at some of the other phases of the project and working on those and at least getting the contract going and that's that's how they did it was actually looking at some of the other phases that they could actually implement before the other higher priority uh, could be taken care of um, another project uh, McGinnis uh, the McGinnis project up at uh, Montana with uh, Confederated Tribes of Salish Kootenai, that project was doing some, actually some removal, besides some prescribed fire road maintenance, uh, there's removal of material. And one of the things that happened with this particular contract, uh, the mill that was, was taking some of the material shut down. And so that was a challenge that this particular contract that they had with uh, the Lolo National Forest but the outcome, they were able to renegotiate the contract because they could figure out what the, the closest milling facility was that could take this material and they just extend it or um, use a higher hauling cost just because they knew that was how they could get this uh, particular contract done. But though that kind of gives the example of some of the things that, that uh, you can be uh, uh, use adjustments or negotiate things with this as kind of a sole source. And, we also had some Forest Service, when we had these workshops with the Forest Service, the Forest Service brought in some of their contracting experts and their NEPA experts, and, and some of the, the NEPA, one of the issues is trying to make these projects larger you know, to make it more efficient, and that's what the NEPA expert was coming in and saying, don't be afraid of making these projects larger. And that was kind of a, a relief to the people in the audience that were that probably weren't as experienced, but being able to get the, the support from line officials and from their NEPA experts to be able to make these contracts larger. But um, probably my last note um, before questions and then working with tribes is as I've been making some presentations starting uh, about tribal history, working with tribe, tribal relations, starting at Oregon State University Starker lecture that's on a video, but after about um, seven or eight presentations at different universities or NRCS staff members, I, I, uh, a student at the University of Washington when they were writing, writing a paper said I was really disturbed what I found out about tribal history. And it's interesting to make presentations and see people fidget you know, in the audience when they hear the history of our tribes, but with anything with growth, you have to remember the acronym LIE, L-I-E. First is, is anything when you go to school or you, you take on a task, you know, you're gonna learn something. I learned an awful lot. Every presentation I made, it was interesting how I watched the audience. Uh, L, is, uh, L is for learn as you go through this process. The next thing is implement. I is for implement, is when you learn something and you meet, work with your cohorts, you know, share what you learn about tribes with your, with your experience. And as you work with tribes, and even as I work with, you know, 60 member tribes, uh, you're always going to feel uncomfortable. As I mentioned, every tribe's different and you, and you don't assume different types of things as you walk into tri like one tribe similar to another. You're always going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Think about when you're working out, you know, your New Year's resolution, I'm going to exercise more. When you start exercising more, your muscles are sore. That's almost what's happening to your emotions and your mentality when, when you're doing something new or something uncomfortable. It's just like your muscles, it's your emotional muscles are being strained a little bit, but it's growth, you know, after, after you get the first, you know, when you're exercising after the first few weeks, you, you know, you're not as sore, that you, you feel growth. And that's almost, and that's what the tribes are the students, this was at the University of Washington presentation. They, even though they were deeply disturbed, they said after this course that they took that they felt so much growth and understanding and, and appreciated not so much that tribes are victims, but but inspired by the resiliency. That's what a lot of students wrote about was, was how much they learned and to be able to understand that the tribal world, that uh, time isn't money, you know, the dimension of time isn't a unit of measure, but the, 
the, the dimension of time is, is the significance of an event or life is how tribes look at it. So I'll take any questions and catch you on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Before I open up for questions, I, I was hoping you could add on to, um, to what Belinda was sharing about the good neighbor authority being different from the master stewardship agreement. And, and Belinda touched on this. She shared that's because the federal government in setting up the GNA didn't give the rights for the counties or the tribes to keep that money the way the master stewardship does. But there's some changes afoot, if you could share that. Right. Um, well, real quick, just even how the Intertribal Timber Council started was uh, the, the truck back in the 70s, uh, the tribes were suing the federal government for mismanagement of their land. And the tribes and the Federal Bureau of Union Affairs got together and said, instead of going through all this efforts of lawsuits, why don't we legislate instead of litigate? So that was one of the reasons why the inter and why one of the reasons why we're a smaller organization is we focus on education, economics, and tribal sovereignty. So um, and working on legislation and one of the legislative fixes um, for the farm bill and this good neighbor authority that counties and tribes weren't allowed to take in the revenue, but what they call it a technical amendment. And right now I can't remember which. Um, uh, representative from Idaho is sponsoring a bill for correct doing a technical amendment of, of having tribe allowing the tribes and counties to keep the revenue but they're looking now they're looking for another uh, uh, Democratic co-sponsor for that so that should be fixed pretty soon Wow you know um, that's hopefully going to happen is, is a fix to that but there are other options for states and tribes to negotiate how a pass-through could happen um, with proceeds. And it doesn't have to be good neighbor authority. It could, it's a tribe, a tribe and, a, and a state could negotiate an authority of a unique type to allow that transfer of funds um, through a state process. Um, counties can do the same thing with their states. You know, it, it's, it's not gonna, I don't think, cause major problems using good neighbor authority. I'd like to see some, you know, let's let's start talking with tribes and figure out which tribes are interested in a potential good neighbor authority. That's just a, another tool um, that um, restriction applies to timber sale proceeds. In the Southwest, our, our timber doesn't create much proceeds. So, you know, it may not be an obstacle to do very much, but uh, there are ways to exchange funds, not just good neighbor funds, but states under shared stewardship, states under their authorities, their departments, uh, an example, uh, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish fund a lot of tribal projects because of that relationship that's built. Um, Forest Service can be a conduit to that. Uh, other federal agencies could be a top conduit to that. Uh, I hope and it's my vision that, that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, learn how to do this partnership business for the get, for, on the benefit of tribes because BIA has contracting authority, 638 contracting authority already, know how to do it. Forest Service is just learning it. BIA has been doing it. But what stops BIA from being your partner conduit to a tribe? I, I, I would ask ITC to, to think about you know, pushing forward that partnership authority more in BIA. Uh, and we see it, you know, there are some, some good stuff related to youth crew training on tribal lands with an education uh, an agreement with BIA. Um, expand those things uh, with, with, with tribes it would be great to include restoration projects, include uh, all kinds of different things. So uh, this workshop or this session is supposed to talk about authorities that, that exist now. It's, it's, there are a lot of authorities that exist that people don't know about and practitioners um, in, in restoration, practitioners in education, conservation education, or whatever you might be doing, there's probably an authority that already exists 
with the tribe to do that, um, either with BIA or their relationship with BLM. Um, tribes are pretty savvy in, in negotiating and na navigating the funding source process. Look to them with ideas and thoughts about what you want to do. If you find a good person, I think someone said, find a good person, they, they could tell you where we, they, a tribe receives particular funds, um, how it might match or leverage um, funds received through another program, federal, state, county, NGO, nonprofit, whatever, whatever grants tribes have, tack onto them where you see a benefit for your organization. Yes. So uh, thank you to the panelists. John, I had a kind of a question, you know, around since you were a former BIA employee. Um, you know, we've as a nonprofit organization, which a lot of folks in this RBCC network are yeah. kind of community-based forestry uh, organizations. Um, you know, our, our partnerships with tribes use our MOUs, mm -hmm. and uh, 638 fund usually goes uh, gets awarded to us or serves as match for like stewardship agreements. Right. It comes down to federal. But one thing we met with BIA on is, and I know the Nature Conservancy might be um, kind of breaking this mold a little, is the BIA's ability, just touched on it, to, to really enter into partnerships with non-government organizations that might be tribally led, mm -hmm. or might not be tribal organizations. And yeah. um, how do you see that changing? Because I think that can leverage a lot of support. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. There, There is many ways in which these relationships could, could work. Um, TNC and other large organizations have agreements already existing with Forest Service and, and other federal agencies. Uh, BIA has been recognized as a land management agency and the, the national TNC agreement, at least for fire, uh, related to fire cohesive strategy and all the uh, fire learning network process and Shrek's burning program, all the great things of the TNC organization. Well, what they do with Forest Service, what they do with BLM and Park Service and other federal agencies, BIA is, is there to represent the tribes that were, were signatories through the interior DOI process. I would like to see a focus of BIA to recognize that opportunity to, to to, at least for that organization, um, tap into providing assistance and, and projects to tribes, direct, directly to the tribe. Um, there are also um, um, ways in which I believe um, connecting with the forcers that, that, um, that, that organizations could find a way to the tribe through the forester site, through our agreements that, that exist or could be developed with the tribe. Um, we all need to link together in some way. Because we have different authorities and, and, and uh, being able to just envision what's possible. Um, the tribe has capacity or, or through these grants even, let's, let's include capacity development to be a grant administrator of a super grant, multiple grants. Pull them all together. Um, to have organizations like the Intertribal Timber Council isn't a 638 organization because we would have to have 68 tribes pass a resolution. But to give you an example, there's a Northern, uh, Northern Indian Business Development Council uh, in Eureka that uh, there's what, 20 tribes that passed a resolution that, that the organization is the 638 organization representing those 20 tribes. So it's, that's how, I believe it was a Department of Labor fund is what that organization was, how that was organized. So that, that would be the model, you know, if, if say, if your organization, if um, wanted to be that, the tribes that would, uh, as I, I mentioned before, you know, all the ranchers, not enough money to, go shares with say 20 tribes, but if there was organization where that money could be 
cool, you know, that's how those tribes worked with uh, Northern Indian, uh, Northern California Indian Business Development Council. Uh, but that would be the model, yeah. Those development councils and those entities that that represent or connections to tribal governments are, are key, I think, because a big challenge working with tribes and being successful in, in tribal contracted programs is the separation of politics, tribal politics, with a business. If it wants to be successful as a tribal business, an enterprise, tribal sawmill, whatever it is, a large challenge is the separation of those business decisions that have to be made to run a business. Get, get involved in tribal government politics, you think U.S. federal politics is complex and, and dramatic? Look at tribal <laughs> politics as, as being maybe ten times that because of your local community, all the challenges and issues: healthcare, security, uh, education, law enforcement, social problems, social programs. Um, all that on a tiny government, tribal government, to be successful in a business development. You need to be isolated, you need to be separated, but yet still have the tribal authority govern the, the path and direction of this development plan. And, and also be able to uh, qualify for special preference under contracts, um, tax purposes, you know, tribes or, or tribal governments need to develop that business development council structure or outside separation with tribal government to figure out a way how a tribe or, or tribes, multiple tribes, um, figure out the shared decision making process. Is it through a board? Is it through uh, uh, some business structure to make business decisions? And just to build on that, I know we've been working the last few years with Lomakasi developing the Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership. And so that's another area through a consortium of tribes. That's our coalition. That's where we're bringing the tribes together through Northern California and uh, Oregon to get together on what we want to do to provide that ecosystem restoration and to join together on these funding streams. But you do need the resolutions. I know in California it's really, really brutal, the water wars, and um, we had to uh, join together in a coalition to get the cultural beneficial use designation for our rivers and streams. And just, to, uh, we worked through the Intertribal Council of California, which my grandfather helped form long ago and far away. So what John's saying is right, even our tribal governments can become cumbersome. So. Um, like the Yurok tribe did the Cultural Fire Management Council. So we have these NGOs and Section 17 businesses forming out from our tribes that can make those quick business decisions, that can form those partnerships. And our job is if we want something uh, to, to pass legislatively, is we need to, again, coming back to informing our elected officials, getting them the right information, drafting the resolutions, drafting the position papers, and being prepared with our elected officials when we get together is that these are the talking points. These are, these, this is what we need you to send to Congress in order to get to leverage this funding down so that we can all win here in our region on the ground. All of our place-based people can win. And what we have out in the rural and frontier communities, tribal communities, is we don't have constituency. So we never get our voice heard. So I, like a lot of you in here are just like the tribes. You know, I, I don't know where you all come from, but you don't have the voice simply because you don't have constituency. Like if Southern California dictates what Northern California does, Portland dictates what Harney County does. And so until, until we can come together in that coalition, that regional base, Intertribal Timber Council, Intertribal Council of California, Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership, this is how we move, just like RBCC. What, what's coming down this year? What, what's DC doing? If we sit and we wait, it's never been good. Um, we need to come up with those solutions that are community-based solutions that fit the community, and we take their best practice models and we mold it to what we need it to be in our community. And that's what empowers these communities and, and the tribes and the governments 
to be able to make the right choices with the options that are laid out there. We can lay the best options out there that still, the power of choice is on those tribal governments, is on our counties, is on uh, the commissioners, it's, it's on us. And, and if we're the ones that know the information, then it's our responsibility to get that information out there. And sometimes they kill, they shoot the messenger. Happens to me all the time. It's like, I just brought the message. No, I mean, so, so you take that heat and, and you, you grow thick skin and you continue to bring the message. This is what we're having to address in water. This is what we're having to address in land conservation. This is what we're addressing in timber, fish and wildlife. And so everybody needs to come together in that uh, um, in that circle and, and really be responsible with how we communicate and how we include all those voices and then elevate that voices from grassroots up to be able to get what we need from the policy down. And so hopefully, again, we shorten that distance between policy and what we need to do on the ground. Um, probably form a Department of Common Sense at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we'll open it up for questions. Yeah. I have two questions, I have many questions, but the two I, I want to ask right now, one's really small, uh, relatively small, and one is kind of bigger. The small one is you know, kind of along the lines of the technical amendment for um, the uh, GNA. I've heard through the Alaska NRCS grapevine that, that um, the financial assistance pot of money and the technical assistance pot of money, which we're, we're using RCPP, that program in, RC, in RCS, to, to develop community-based, tribal community-based management plans for, <clears throat> excuse me, public and private lands around communities. And the technical assistance money has been instrumental. It's been 90% of the, of the funding because we're doing basic inventory and assessment work to figure out where the projects are out on the ground. We're engaging with the community to figure out what the priorities are, and then that's setting the, the program of work for the future. But there's a rulemaking happening right now for RCPP where somewhere somebody has said we want the FA which we can't use very flexibly it's really just for contracting work on the ground it's not for planning it's not for inventory it's not for workforce development etc they're they're wanting to go to a 70 30 70 percent of the project has to be FA 30 percent of the project has to be or can be uh, TA and that's going to that's going to essentially kill any new communities' opportunities to be able to use this program, which has been great for the last six years or so, to to get on board with this model and develop their own plans, and then sort of start plugging into the various funding sources to get projects out on the ground. So, have you heard of anything that we can do to try to get the ear of whoever's doing the rulemaking to correct that trajectory? Yeah, one, one of the things, or one reason why some of the, tri or the tribal parts of the Farm Bill was put in was a collaboration with the Intertribal Timber Camp. The tribes actually were more of a facilitator with the National Association of State Foresters. That the National Association of State Foresters has a tribal relations committee where Chris Bache, the state forester in Alaska, is part of that. And we have conference calls and we trade, or we send actually joint letters to Congress to support a lot of our tribal ideas and, and issues are very similar to state. So that we usually send joint letters and we share our legislation together. So if it's coming out of, well, I could talk with Chris or just say, hey, because I know a lot of things, issues, they come out of the flyer. But in California, Alaska, there's a lot of things in Oregon, but there's several state foresters that are on that tribal relations committee and, and probably bring that up at our next conference call with them. Great, and I got some advice to try to talk to Burkowski and Don Young about writing a letter as well to try to correct this. And we don't know when the rules can actually come down, but it, there should be some kind of a public announcement, I, I assume, and that we'll have a little bit of time to submit that feedback. And if there's a, a, just a minute, a, the National Congress of American Indians is our embassy back in Washington, D.C., so to speak. So what uh, Don was talking about, uh, that's where a lot of our resolutions, so the position papers, so this would be something that you could uh, present to a tribe 
corporation. I know in Alaska they have the corporations, and then uh, get a letter of resolutions, you know, and, and flood it through the National Congress of American Indians too. And then they they're working the hill all the time, and they're right on these issues. So whenever we have uh, those that level, that's where we get the, all the letters, all the resolutions. We bump it up to the NCAI, which we're a member of. Our tribes a member. A lot of tribes are a member there, and then we can get it floated of what we need to change. And the the big question is, you know, I've been working with a few people. Carla Kaluskan as Forest Service Tribal Relations Person in uh, Southeast Alaska, Tongass, and then, you know, um, EDs of tribal governments, et cetera, on, you know, reviewing the new Farm Bill language, looking for exciting stuff, and saw the, the under the Tribal Forest Protection Act, the demonstration projects, and, and we're just wondering what could that be, and how do we compact, and, you know, like the, the, the nuts and bolts, because it sounds like there's something there, but it hasn't been figured out. We want to establish a pilot study area, basically, around one of these RCPP yeah. communities. Well, as, as far as I know, internally in the Forest Service, um, the, the process has not been um, uh, sent down to the regions or to the forest on how it's actually going to be implemented. The, the, the most current status is that USDA had asked for a status check on movement of Farm Bill authorities. And so a request to the regions came um, right before Christmas to identify demonstration tribes. And so um, under a sort of a demonstration uh, rollout, um, and we've done that, we've, we've talked to a few tribes in my region about interest in being considered a demonstration project. However, the process, rulemaking, the implementation, the negotiation process, uh, whatever it might be, has not been issued by the Washington office. And I'm waiting for it, just like you're waiting for it, and tribes across the country are waiting for it. Um, so I hope it's coming very soon. Um, we do know a few things It's that this demonstration is not funded, doesn't get a line item in the Forest Service budget, so we're gonna to have to figure out how to integrate other program funds or um, other partner funds to, to contribute toward this. Um, tribes know 638 process very well. Don probably is involved in, uh, I think, an ITC effort with the Forest Service to provide training so maybe he can give you an update, maybe more on the training side. Yeah, we're, we're working with the, with the Forest Service on doing workshops like we did with the TFPA, but the same group that did the TFPA is now working with this Farm Bill workshops. And, uh, the first one's going to be down in southwest Albuquerque. We looked at March, maybe April, where we're working with the Forest Service on getting the first one down in, in the southwest. The next one's probably going to be in Spokane in May. And the other thing, uh, the Intertribal Timber Council's national, national meeting is going to be in Fairbanks the first week of June. And so the, 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 we have workshops during that, our national symposium, and the, the contra Farm Bill is going to be part of that, uh, uh, part of that meeting too. So Are those workshops open? Yeah. Yeah, so and Chris, Chris is going to be there as, as part of part of the present. Actually, Chris managed to stay. He used to be actually on the board of directors for the ITC for a number of years when he was at Tanana Chiefs. So will he be at all of them or just? No, uh, Chris will be Chris will be at the one in Fairbanks. And, and we don't have we don't have that workshop scheduled yet, you know, the one in Spokane for, for May yet. So, but I, I don't Thing. But what we've done is actually invited tribes who want to do the compact or contract, and, and it's the tribes that are actually actually getting the pro, uh, projects going. It's a it's a real hands on. It's not we have a brief presentation and then the first morning, and then the tribes and the Forest Service get down and they really do the dirty work. Good, good. That's good to hear. Thanks. Yeah, great. We still have about 10 minutes left. Um, other questions? Um, thank you.
thank you for what you've shared so far. I'm curious, given that a lot of people here are involved in collaboratives um, who are working on trying to influence forest service decision making and also interested in working more with tribal partners, but I'm curious if you have thoughts on how those collaboratives can incorporate tribes into their processes um, while also acknowledging the separate processes that tribes have to work with the federal government um, and how those different relationships can um, all take place without stepping over um, the sovereign relationship that tribes I know that Lomakasi has developed out of the depths of adversity of probably that collaborative framework model. And so within the collaborative, even the collaborative itself, um, there's that expectation of inclusion. So it's really on us, I believe, to educate ourselves on both sides. There's ignorance on both sides. So how do you open up the communication to do the outreach and engagement with tribes? Well, with the Karuk tribe, with the Master Stewardship Agreement, you have, uh, we have a Master Stewardship Agreement. The Karuk tribe is government to government with the Forest Service, and then Loma Kasi is on supplemental project agreements. So like with the Klamath tribes, um, uh, you coach, you know, we can coach the tribes to, you, you are that government to government authority. So government to government consultation under executive order 13175 under the Clinton administration in 2000 is what gives us that ability to sit down and do consultation. And consultation is not with line officers. Consultation is if we uh, you know, need to call the undersecretary and you can address this farm bill situation. The tribes have the ability to do that. Do we exercise it all the time? Um, Yes, I mean, we do, but do we, do we know what we're supposed to be? Uh, are we informed in making those choices? And so understanding intergovernmental affairs coordination, understanding that you have like a self-governance coordinator in some tribes that is this outreach person that you can contact, finding that contact within every tribe. So maybe it's in the Natural Resource Department, maybe it's in the Cultural Heritage Department. So it really is a lot of homework of, of what tribe are we working with and who are those community thought leaders, who, who, what's the traditional leader, who is on council, and what element of this community do we need to do that outreach to? And do we need to include in these conversations? And so I just really believe it's a lot of homework and then those informal meetings, I can't, uh, I can't stress enough. I've been told myself, go have coffee with this person. Well, I, it's like patience is a virtue. I have virtually none. It's like I don't have time to go have coffee with. Them. Yes, you you need to go have coffee. You need to sit down and have tea. You need to build that relationship of trust, and that just takes time. And so, what comes to we, uh, you know us showing up in the community? My background's health and human services. We used to come. It's like if we're doing it to you instead of with you. And I think we all need to slow down. And that's part of my issue is slowing down to make sure that everybody understands that everybody has the same information and that we're all moving down the road together. And we need to understand intergovernmental affairs coordination, what we need to do with the community, how we need to reach those community members, the labor workforce, and then also traditional leaders of why are we protecting water, why are we protecting the land, why are we protecting the language and those place-based areas. And it's just a lot of education and across the board, we need to continually educate ourselves, each other, and then know where we're at, be realistic with ourselves. I shared yesterday, be realistic with our own swaths, our own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and put the right people on the playing field where we're gonna get the success. And that's, that's getting really honest with each other. Uh, I always say, you know, I can write a grant, but I can't figure out how to get the jack out of my car. You know, somebody else is mechanical. I need my son to help me do that. You know, not really, but I mean, those are the kind of differences that we have in each other. You know, somebody's a really good grant writer, but somebody else needs to go present that or we're gonna kill our initiative. 
And so that's where we have to get really honest with each other about who we are, what we bring to the table, what we don't have, and then how we're all gonna get there together. Uh, I was just gonna mention, I um, have some resources for folks. One I like to hand out when I make presentations to folks that have never worked with tribes. It's called the Culture Card, and it's just like a road, but it looks like a, a map when you unfold it. It's kind of like American Indian Alaska Native 101. It was built or created from our tribal medical community for first responders that go on to reservations. Another one is Portland State University offers a professional certificate in tribal relations um, developed by uh, affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, the leaders, uh, tribal relations liaisons. They started working with these jobs with state, federal government. What do I do? And, and that's what this one tribal member said. Well, we really need a, a course to really tell people how to work. And, and remember with the definition of, of collaboration or consultation, it, again, it's in the tribe's language. You know, that, that's what's really important is, is making sure that it's, they're the ones that are defining what is protection, what is collaboration, what is consultation. And there's another that talks about the decision making with tribe. There's a book that's just published called uh, Medicine Wheel. And it's out of the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Mike Marchand, he's the former um, chairman of the uh, Colville tribe, was the lead author of the book. And I was one of the contributing authors in this book. So that's some more information of, of how tribe, it's a lot of the Washington state tribes and Umatilla was involved with uh, providing authors for this particular book that talks about collaboration, council, decision making with tribes and resources. I just wondered, John, if you could expand on that and talk about anything at the collaborative table that the Forest Service could do to make it work more effectively. Some of the tribes I work with don't want to go to the collaborative table because the Forest Service might count that as consultation, no. and they don't—they're afraid of that. Well, I, I, I hope that different parts of the Forest Service uh, structure offer a partnership coordinator. Uh, like, uh, you know, I'm happy in, to be in a partnership coordinator position for the Forest Service. My focus is on restoration, restoration projects. Uh, but I consider my responsibility to include partners of all types, that includes tribes. Go, if you're seeking a, a path to connect with the tribe, um, ask the Forest Service, put it on their radar and, and give them the task to say, hey, how do you include tribes? Ask of your state. You know, In New Mexico, we have a new state forester and we're undergoing shared stewardship and forest action plan revision process. Um, I communicate with tribes and say, hey, ask your state forester to be part of this process. How, do we, how can we get involved? Um, and that also is on the, the backs and, and role of being collaborators. Ask about tribal inclusion of the process you're involved with. If it's forest plan revision, if it's state forest action plan revision, um, if it's shared stewardship, if it's CFLR, if it's uh, whatever you're involved with in the planning process, if you have a, a, a need that you see tribes are not included, ask it, please. Um, you got projects going on in your community and you wonder about tribal inclusion, and if it's funded by the Forest Service, ask the Forest Service. If it's funded by NRCS through RCPP or another program, ask the project administrator and federal source of the funding or state source or county source, whoever it might be, say, hey, let's include tribes. Make that part of the, the, the project mission. But, I hope that, that all of us as civil servants and, and employees of state governments, local governments, and uh, federal government recognize that, that it includes representation and inclusion and respect for all of our peoples and communities.
things or different types. If, if they don't know how to do it, there's plenty of help. There's experts around who, who have worked with tribes who, who have been successful in tribal communities and uh, trusted, trust, who are trusted in um, tribes. And, uh, if you want to build it, um, don't know how to do it, find someone who is. And if they're wanting to continue that, I'm sure they'd be more than willing to help you and, and work with you to, to figure out that navigation process and how to do it. Um, but please ask for it. You know, I, in the Southwest region, when we see large CFLR projects, shared stewardship, joint chiefs, um, RCPP, see these large initiatives that the federal government rolls out for landscape scale restoration, my first ask is, where is tribal inclusion? and put it on planners of those projects to figure it out. I, I can suggest it, and I'm at the regional office, but, but the forests who are developing those things, you know, I kind of, you know, we put district rangers and forest supervisors on kind of the hot seat, you know, asking them for, you know, what's your tribal connection? We've got people and, and district rangers, Nolan Colgrove, uh, Mark Sando in Arizona, we have Alvin Whitehair, who's a district ranger in New Mexico, who's native, many native staff on our Forest Service staff. I'd like to see more representation on BLM staff, Park Service leadership. You know, all of our federal agencies should have tribal staff within it. They should hire, they should promote diversity. That's how you get inclusion through the tribes. Any other questions or thoughts for our panel? Okay, well that's actually pretty good timing. We're just about out of time, so if you'll just join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> and, and offer, if there's any final thoughts you want to share, any closing remarks, no pressure, but I don't want to cut you short. Uh, this is one I end the presentations with other one I did is is the success story I was involved when I was force manager uh, back 1984 uh, 1982 actually I met I was on a fire uh, at Warm Springs and, and my tribal crew Cayuse crew came over and I started hearing their story how they were formed and it was a joint state tribal force service crew you know this is back 36 years ago, or a lot of a collaboration of John Lowe was the force or force supervisor there. And one of our tribal members was the force dispatcher, Louis Dick, that way, because that's how we refer to people when they pass away with that way. But Louis was the force uh, dispatcher, and his dream was to get the force supervisor's office out of the city of Pendleton and onto the reservation back in 1982. And what he had, the collaboration with the state, how it started, or the seed, was what we call the safety meeting after work every Friday. And the safety meeting is where the Forest Service and state people and tribal people, we would have beer and pizza at the pizza parlor. You know, right, there's this pizza parlor that's still there in Pendleton. And, and that's where we would just all sit and talk with each other just to get to know each other. And even some of the projects, this McGinnis Creek project, it was the forest manager and the force, the, uh, one of the forest service people, they were on a baseball team, you know, or coaching kids. And it was more of a community thing. And, and the safety meeting is what Louie called it. It was just people to get together informally, to get to know each other. And, and it's a long-term relationship. That That's one of the, the critiques tribes have with the Forest Service, that there's too much turnover with some of the line officials. But anyway, uh, that was Louie's dream in 1982, was to have the Forest Supervisor's Office on the reservation. And it started out with these informal get-togethers of just getting to know each other, build relationships, because that's what I'm just thinking, that <laughs> you're related to to Captain Jack were relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Pit River, oh, Modoc, because I'm part of our family. But we always introduce ourselves, uh, you 
know, who are you related to? Usually that's the introduction because lo and behold, we're probably family somewhere down the line. Or we know somebody from that tribe. But it's about building relationships, um, more of a reconciliation because they're, especially in Oregon, it, it's really a sad history when you hear about it or, or my aunts and uncles, very much like if you've ever seen the uh, movie The Butler, where the, uh, where the butler was part of the president, the presidents and his son was part of the civil, civil rights movement and telling his son about memories of getting hung and shot. And, and that's what my aunts and uncles remember. If they, back in Oregon, if you left the reservation, you got shot. And it, it, it's really interesting to research the smoking gun to see that fear and look in their eyes of, of my elders. But anyway, um, lo and behold, it, you know, it took 30 years, but in, in 2012, the, the Forest Service moved their, uh, moved their uh, signed an agreement with the Umatilla Tribe, and, and right across the street from the tribe, casino is a Forest Service supervisor's office now. So it took 30 years, but 30 years of safety meetings and building relationship between the tribe, Forest Service, state, uh, that dream came true. So what we're starting, what you're thinking about doing something or building relationships for tribes. Thirty years, thirty years later, you know that that dream could come true for both uh, uh, the community out there. So I'll just leave that good story. You know, if you build it and think about it, it'll happen. Yeah, and I, my closing thoughts, I always say I'm a sports mom. It's like teamwork makes the dream work, you know. We just all need to be cognizant of, of really looking out for each other and, and then going back and learning from those traditions from the past because I am firmly convinced that those traditions from the past can be woven into our future and for our, our youth today. I mean, we're looking around, I know, at my age for successional planning. I think just being able to... Uh, create uh, an environment where youth, where tribes, where uh, everybody out there can be involved in those intergenerational capacities and being able to care for the land, care for the people, restore these ecosystems to some semblance of, of health. And Lomakasi means life in balance. And, um, and uh, Konakasi, I believe, is the life out, out of balance. I mean, in the Hopi words and so we're trying to bring that balance back and so whatever we do to build those bridges with any community member that we can build these bridges with and to uh, share our expertise to share our knowledge to freely give of the talents and abilities and skill sets that we have to bring uh, our communities back into balance and this collaborative work I, I firmly believe is the way that we do that and we coordinate we collaborate we integrate all these best practices and sometimes it takes different modalities of treatment for the land just like my background people you need to integrate the modalities of treatment we need to do the same thing we need to bring ceremonies back we need to bring uh, the best practices our first best stores back we need to put fire back on this land and we need, need to set the stage to be able to do that. We can't just go light it up now because we have catastrophe, but we need to set the stage to bring these best practices back. So it really is everybody. And our, our tribal, our, our indigenous Aboriginal people have and have those answers and just being able to give them, like the, the Nature Conservancy is the voice choice in action. That's how they framed it. So however we frame it, we're giving voice to the voiceless we're providing options for best practices and choices, and then we're following through with the evaluations and how well did we do, and, and just being honest about that. And uh, I'll, I'll close with, uh, with a thank you for allowing me to be part of your conversation for the last few days and listening, and you've helped me not only in my professional career as a partnership coordinator, but also being able to uh, apply what I see in talking in the conversations to uh, improving uh, advancement of my personal interests, of course, as tribes and, and tribal uh, involvement, tribal inclusion. Um, like, so I commend your organization. Your organization has values similar to what tribes have. Uh, we're all behind empowering. We're all involved and, and interested in surviving and thriving 
rule settings. Um, you know, the recognition of, of tribes and social problems and, and community um, measures that, that um, demonstrate and portray a tough life. It's, it's a tough one. We've, we've got some major obstacles and, and problems in, in, in tribal communities. When you think about focus and priority on missing and, and murdered women on tribal communities. That's, that's a very big concern and issue. Drug abuse, social problems, and the solutions are what you are involved with. The same tribes are the same. We're all together in this. And so uh, we've, got, we've got to work together. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have a 15-minute um, break, and then we're going to meet back in here for closing remarks for the whole session. Um, there's coffee in the back. The restaurant.